Teach me about the Great Lakes. Teach me about the Great Lakes. Ciao. Welcome back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a twice monthly podcast in which I, a Great Lakes novice, total novice, ask people who are smarter and harder working than I am to teach me all about the Great Lakes. My name is Stuart Carlton, and I work with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and I'm joined today by the one, the only, the special Carolyn Foley. Carolyn, research coordinator at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. What is up? Um, not much, Stuart. It's um it's both wonderful. I mean I always mention the weather. It's really nice outside, but that also scares me a little bit because it's February. But that's all right. <laughs> yes. It should not be really nice. We always mention the weather, which is why we need a bit, but we're still working on a bit. Hey, if you have an idea for an intro bit, <laughs> teach me about the Great Lakes at gmail.com. But but yeah, this was actually our last episode. As I sure you remember, we uh, spoke with Dr. Richard Rude about these warm winters and lake ice and, and what that meant. And no, I, it's freaky too. It should not be this nice in February. Yeah. Um, but it is. Yep. And the thing is, not much you or I going to do about it, so you might as well just enjoy it. All right. I will try to do that. So we have housekeeping Yes, we do have housekeeping. I was going to do a professional thingy, but yep, no, first we have housekeeping. I guess the professional thing would be to read the rundown. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Hey, everybody. If you missed it, we just recorded our, uh, depending on how you do the math, third or fourth episode of Ask Dr. Fish live. Um, and we'll be releasing it as a podcast. That's going to be in the Teach Me About the Great Lakes feed coming uh, probably later the week after you hear this or maybe the next week. So keep your eyes there. And if you want to subscribe to Ask Dr. Fish separately, just go to AskDrFish.com. In fact, I recommend subscribing to it in both and downloading it multiple times, but you can, of course, do whatever you want with that. Um, that is one bit of housekeeping. The other bit of housekeeping is, if you recall, we are fresh off the Lakeys. And in the Lakeys, we featured a lot of really great work. If, for those of you who don't know about the Lakeys, because you've just started listening, welcome. And the Lakeys are, are uh, it's a, I think the tagline is, quite possibly not the least prestigious uh, Great Lakes related awards ceremony that there is. And so we featured a bunch of really great work uh, um, in December on the Lakeys, but not everybody could be a Lakey winner. But that doesn't mean that we want to just throw away the other stuff. And so we're featuring some of the uh, Lakey nominees, maybe that we're not winners here. And the one that we're going to feature today is really cool, Carolyn. It is a uh, state of the Great Lakes website. This is a huge joint venture by um, like the U.S. government, the Canada government, all sorts of universities, the, you know, NOAA, everybody. It's at um, stateofgreatlakes.net. Uh, and we'll put a link to that in our show notes. And when you go there, uh, it, what it does is it's kind of a high level summary of what we know about the Great Lakes. Uh, and it starts, what I like about it is it starts with like, it starts with the end, right? It starts with the conclusion. You scroll down, kind of a cool website, very responsive. And can we drink the water? And the answer is yes. The Great Lakes remain a source of high quality drinking water when treated. And so generally you can drink the water. Can we swim at the beaches? Yes. However, some beaches are occasionally unsafe for swimming due to bacterial contamination. <laughs> Reminds me of Texas, um, indicating pathogen risk. And so they, they scroll through all these, but then on each one of these, you can click through and see the assessment. And uh, so it starts out really high level, but then it talks about like the status and trends and then they have graphs and then they have data, right? So you can start really high level, but you can get kind of as nerdy as you want. And so that's what I like about this site, Carolyn. Yeah. And it's a, a huge effort of, yeah, like um, international and tribal agencies working together and they have years and years that they've been kind of putting out the state of the Great Lakes kind of um, status and stuff. But to see it in this format is really innovative and very, very cool. I like it. And I think they're going to try to continue to update it on a periodic basis. So I, I hope that they do. And then uh, what I also like is they have sort of the, an overall status to of each lake, like with Lake Superior, of course, they talk about how it's assessed as good and unchanging. So they have like the current status and then the trend, right? So the status is good. The trend is unchanging. Lake Michigan, the status is fair. The trend is unchanging. I don't see somebody's unchanging. It'd be nice to see some changing uh, for the better. Uh, Lake Erie, of course, is poor and unchanging. Poor Lake Erie. Uh, and Lake Ontario is uh, fair to unchanging to improving. And I skipped over Huron, which is good and unchanging. But So they have all this information. So very cool website. Uh, very worthy Lakey nominee. And arguably Lake Huron and Lake Michigan are just the same lake. <gasps> she said it. All right. <sighs> Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 that's fine, but let's let's do it the right way. It's a Great Lakes factoid. A Great Lakes factoid. It's a great factoid about the Great Lakes. Cha. Arguably, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are the same lake. Yep. Okay, but 
one thing about these statuses and trends is that it points to this idea of resilience, right? And that's going to take us into our, our guest today is, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about resilience in my job and it's Sea Grant. You know, there's a big focus on resilience lately these last couple of years. And going forward, there's going to be even more of a focus on resilience. Funny thing about resilience, Carolyn. Oh, what's that, Stuart? I don't know what it is. Uh, and so um, <laughs> it's really kind of a complicated topic. That's who you talk to. Yeah. Uh, so that's the point of today's interview. But first, we are going to interview. This is super fun. She is a researcher, and we all know what that means. Researcher feature, a feature in which a researcher going to teach us about the Great Lakes. Our guest today is Sarah Doby. She is a doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan in the uh, Department of Urban and Regional Planning. And she is here uh, because she's just published a cool, well, I guess a couple, no, it just came out actually in December, it looks like, a cool paper um, in the Journal of Great Lakes Research called Defining Coastal Resilience in the Great Lakes, a Systematic Review and Critical Comparison. So as we're thinking about resilience and trying to figure out what it means, uh, we found the expert. Let's just talk to her. That's the whole point of this dang show. So that's what we're going to do. But first, Sarah, let's talk, uh, let's talk big picture um, first, let's talk about you. What is it? How did you get into like resilience research? How is this related to what you're interested in? How did, you know, what's the origin story for Sarah Doby? Yeah. So I was always that kid that loved doing research. When I found something I was really interested in, I would read every book in my school library and elementary school because, yes, it dates back that long ago um, and the public library. And then as Google started becoming more of a thing, you know, I'd start diving in and pulling up documentaries on uh, YouTube and stuff. So, you know, my interest took me to ancient Egypt, to pandas, uh, panda bears, but not actually bears, as my friends get mad when I tell them. <laughs> Um, and then as I, I, I got older, I became a bit of like an environmentalist. I guess the panda should have been a red flag there or a green flag, I guess, in this case. And I decided to go to college for environmental science. I'd been between like mechanical engineering, computer science and environmental science. And I decided to go be a hippie. <laughs> and I started off at the College of Brockport in upstate New York. And um, I knew I wanted to get into research because, again, loved research. And um, one of my professors, my second semester, was looking for someone to work in his fish lab. And uh, I was just like, me, me, pick me. You know, I had the highest grade in the class, the obvious choice. And then um, our lab rolls around for, it was like biology of organisms or something like that. And I went to touch a fish and I screamed like very loudly, <laughs> jumped like a foot in the, in the air. Right. And everyone's just laughing at me, making fun of me. And I'm like, oh crap, I'm not going to get this job. So naturally, I go to Walmart, I buy a fish, a little goldfish, and I practice picking it up <laughs> and putting it down. And I go back and I tell the professor this story, and he just died, and he gave me the job on the spot. So, you know, I started getting into kind of this, like, Great Lakes uh, resiliency aspect a bit back then. Uh, we were focusing on kind of environmental change, invasive species in the Great Lakes and in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. Um, as much as I loved my fish in the fish lab, um, I ended up transferring to focus on like corporate sustainability and corporate social responsibility, kind of looking at how to go beyond maybe one problem with one species and one ecosystem to focus on kind of how these larger systems can start to affect change. And from there, my interest took me in all sorts of directions. I knew I wanted to get back into research. The place I was going to school was much more applied. And so there was one person in my department who I love, Jen Schneider. She's like a second mom to me. And she was doing research on this thing called community resilience. I had no idea what that was. I just wanted to get my hand back into that research pot. And so I started doing some work with her on the side, kind of looking at how do we bridge this gap between what companies are doing and what communities need to do. Um, and so not to go into too long winded of a story, but I ended up doing some consulting in resilience, ended up at ASU doing some research with Sarah Miro, one of you know, the top experts in the resiliency field. She probably knows way more than me. You should definitely get her on here sometime. Yeah, she's not Great Lakes. Nah, we don't care. <laughs> we got you. We don't need. Um, and yeah, I ended up applying in Michigan and I came here for urban planning and uh, did some Great Lakes research with Richard Norton here and some other folks. And I just kind of ended up going down this path and intersecting with folks from different agencies um, and nonprofits in the Great Lakes. And here I am today. 
I'm really struck by how much like a uh, uh, the right meeting the right faculty member at the right time can make a difference for people in terms of. I mean, that's absolutely why I'm doing. When I, I mean, I wanted to go on field trips. I wanted to touch fish. I don't necessarily reflect your uh, <laughs> quote unquote highest grade in the class ideal. That wasn't necessarily my lived experience. Um, but but uh, like those mentor type roles are super critical, aren't they? Oh yeah, definitely. I I'm very grateful because I probably have almost a dozen mentors who have been really critical in my own development, kind of along this path. Jen Schneider, who I mentioned, is one. I also have worked with Joyce Coffee from Climate Resilience Consulting on a lot of great work and some others. Um, they definitely influenced the path I've taken a lot. And I was very fortunate um, that they gave me a lot of opportunities to really get my hands dirty with some of this Great Lakes stuff and the resilience research. Well, it seems like um, it's well earned if you're like willing to be like, OK, I scream, but I am going to go teach myself <laughs> to pick up a fish without screaming. <laughs> like that's dedication. That's pretty amazing. So. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. The professor made me promise to stop traumatizing my fish, though, when he gave me the job. He's like, oh, you have to do me one favor. Stop picking up the fish. Okay. So in the intro, I said, you know, resiliency depends on who you talk to. And so, like, resiliency, it's kind of a, a fractured term or whatever. Why do you think it is so complicated to define? Yeah, I mean, I think first off, kind of like sustainability, it's almost like this idealistic state um, that we're in now or we want to get to in the future, right? And it's really hard to measure. We don't have any direct measure of what resilience is, right? So it's this fractured or a lot of people call it this fuzzy concept. And we also, when we apply resiliency to planning and policymaking, we do it at different geographic scales. So we might be talking about the local level. We could be talking about one neighborhood uh, we could also be talking about a whole ecosystem or a state or an entire nation, right? And so those geographies don't always line up when we start to look across the definitions. And also when we start to define resilience, we can be talking about a bunch of different systems. Are we talking about resiliency of people, of society, um, of individuals? Are we talking about an ecosystem um, a watershed? Are we talking about um, infrastructure, right? So there's so many different ways that we can apply this term. Um, and it leads to kind of a lot of discrepancies. So you're talking about different geographic extents, different, I mean, just numbers, of people, what, all that stuff is important. I think part of it too, is that it's an existing word. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think that can be complicated too, because there's a dictionary definition that, that might be different from the other stuff. So within that, like why... Does it matter? I mean, or do we just go forward and we're all confused? Like, why do a whole research project trying to figure out what resilience means? And we all kind of know what it means, right? You've got the fuzzy thing, so you just sort of defocus your eyes and it's fine, right? Why do we want to bring it into sharp focus? I definitely think of resiliency as a way of thinking kind of like sustainability, right? Where we're thinking systematically about how these different risks can affect people, ecosystems, infrastructure. Um, and at the end of the day, the exact phrasing we use might not matter that much. But I think what's more important is what the definitions reflect. So when I define something, I'm showing what my perspective is on resiliency and how I'm approaching the problem, right? And so um, I, the reason I brought up Sarah Miro earlier is I love this paper that she wrote way back when on the five W's of resilience. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself a bit here with the interview questions, but basically who we define resilience for, kind of the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why of resiliency has very like real implications when we start applying these definitions for planning. And so if I'm sitting here, maybe I'm more of like a social science perspective and I'm like, okay, resiliency, if we're talking about green infrastructure planning, as she discusses in this paper, um, if I'm focused on equity and access to green space, produces a very different prioritization in terms of where we cite green infrastructure compared to if we're talking about controlling stormwater management. Um, also, when we start thinking about kind of some of the upcoming Great Lakes policy in the works, again, the definitions become really important because are we prioritizing uh, resiliency for individuals? So someone's property is going to fall into the water, fall into the lake. Should we be trying to protect like their individual property rights? Or are we talking more broadly about impacts to the community? Um, and are we prioritizing resiliency for people or ecosystems? And sometimes there's trade-offs there. And so rather than getting the importance of getting kind of those perfect words on the page, I think the definitions really come into play um, when we're trying to understand what's really behind the thinking that people are using for planning. 
it's the conversations, right? I love the, so what I wrote down on my notes uh, that I will then recycle, but let's pretend that I won't. Um, the, the definition of resilience reflects your priorities, right? And that to me is a, such a clever, I hadn't thought about it in quite those terms, but like I mentioned, I think in the intro, Sea Grant is doing a lot of focusing on resiliency now, and, and there's some money for resiliency projects. And within our program, specifically within Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, we're like, well, what is resiliency? It could be a bunch of things. But then we get the guidance from the national office and they have a, they have a, not narrow, it is broad, but, but a definition. They have sideboards on what resiliency is. And there's plenty of projects you could call resiliency that aren't there, that aren't in those sideboards. And, and that's okay. But the point is right. These are those priorities. So I really like that. Uh, three years ago, I guess we would have said the, the, you know, the real resiliency was the friends we made or the conversations we had along the way. But that, that sort of meme is kind of memed out, I think. But that's fascinating. So we've run into that too, um, even looking at like a, a local level that like in Lake Michigan, for example, if somebody wants to armor their shoreline, it has impacts like down the way and affecting their neighbors and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that defining that up, up front um, seems like a really good way to do it. But why are the five W's a good fit for the project that you did here? And are there any other options for defining resilience? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I guess I'll start with the overview of the project a bit. So um, as I mentioned, when I came to Michigan, I started doing some Great Lakes research. I was trying to get my footing and figure out kind of what do I want to focus on as a researcher? Um, and I was working closely with someone in the department that does Great Lakes research. So that's kind of how I ended up here. And I grew up in Rochester, New York, so I naturally love the Great Lakes. And we had been doing some work on kind of climate risk and vulnerability assessment. And we started to realize that the ways that we're like going about prioritizing where we put resources in communities are often embedded with a lot of assumptions and biases. And it kind of led us down the path of saying, well, maybe before we try to figure out how to prioritize resources for resilience, we should be focusing on how we want to ultimately define it and what we want those priorities to be, right? Going back to that conversation a bit. And I ended up becoming connected with some folks at the Nature Conservancy, um, Patrick Doran, I believe he's the Associate State Director in Michigan. Um, and we were kind of talking about this issue of defining resiliency and some of the concerns they had with, for example, the Great Lakes Coastal Resiliency Study that was up and coming, that they wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page and we're not losing this focus on, you know, nature for nature's sake, as well as kind of this need for social equity. And so as kind of a first step um, as part of our work together we decided to look at, okay, how are folks in the Great Lakes engaged in like coastal natural resources management defining resilience, right? We know it's a really fractured concept. It's very fuzzy. And we know that there could be some tensions in policymaking due to differences in language, right? If we don't all get on the same page first. So I think this is kind of the first step before we even get to that stage of maybe like agenda, agenda setting and getting this problem on the agenda is to figure out what should that agenda even be, right? And so I think it was something like 70 some odd stakeholders we included in the analysis or that had definitions for the analysis. So what you do? Did you review documents or did you, you know, talk to people on the phone? Well, nobody talks on the phone, but, you know, what uh, <laughs> did you Zoom them or whatever? You, right. Yeah, well, as a little uh, PhD researcher here, I didn't have a lot of funding. So I focused primarily on document analysis just for this first round um, with the intention of hopefully in the future following up to do interviews. And so basically, I started searching online um, for the initial list of stakeholders we had and um, started to pull definitions. So I tried to find definitions specific to coastal resilience. But if they didn't have something called coastal resilience or coastal adaptation, um, then I went back and did a secondary search where I just identified, all right, are they talking about resilience in the context of a coastal setting? And if so, how are they defining resiliency within that context? I have um, two things I wanted to add. Number one, if anybody who's listening to this podcast ever gets a request for a phone call or interview from Sarah Doby, do please say yes to help her with her future <laughs> research efforts. Okay. Three letters, one syllable. Yeah. Um, and then um, <laughs> the second one is, so, okay, so you're looking at these documents and you're, you're saying, okay, how did you define coastal resilience? I desperately want to ask, what do they call the coast? But I know that's a whole other can of like worms because. No, nope, nope, that's, you can write that paper. So, yeah, because shoreline, like near shore means very different things depending on who you're talking to and where they're sampling. But I will not, I just needed to say it. It needed to get off my chest. But um, were there any surprises um, when you were doing the research that um, came along for you? Yeah, so. 
a lot of times when we define resiliency, we usually talk about kind of three pathways to resilience. And that's usually a really easy way to group the definitions. The first is kind of this idea of resilience as persistence, where we want to bounce back after a disturbance. There's this common state that maybe an ecosystem is usually in or a population is usually in in a society. And so after the disturbance, we want them to get back to where they were. The second pathway is adaptation, right? Where we're accepting that maybe there's not like one static state that we should be getting back to and that, you know, we're starting to have more disturbance and things are changing. And so rather than trying to reach this like one state, have things be the same, we start focusing on what are the critical functions maybe of the ecosystem or the society or the infrastructure and how do we restore those? And so we make small changes to our existing systems generally to kind of ensure that maybe if an infrastructure provides energy and water, can it continue to do that uh, when we have a flood or something by the shore, maybe. And then we get into transformation where we're just accepting that our current systems are flawed. We shouldn't be developing maybe on the lake. You know, let's not armor, let's not elevate our homes. Let's get things out of harm's way and rethink the way um, that we're even approaching something like planning and policymaking, right? Um, and so to get to kind of your question, I kind of expected to see those three definitions when I was looking at the research. But what I kind of came across was they don't necessarily use that terminology in the way we use it in theory. And maybe that doesn't really matter. So when they talk about adaptation, sometimes they still talk about bouncing back. So did they really mean adaptation or do they really understand what adaptation is? They probably do, right? Because again, at a certain point, I think practitioners definitely know more than researchers when it comes to what these definitions really are. We can just kind of help to shed the light on it. Um, now, what did really surprise me um, was kind of two things. First off, this like tension that we talked about a bit before that you've both probably observed frequently in your work with private property versus kind of the need for like the public good of these ecosystem services provided by coastal settings was pretty much completely absent, absent from like these definitions and these conversations about resiliency when you started digging into the literature. Um, they did kind of reflect kind of maybe this like broader, not individual perspective, um, which might make sense, but that's a huge tension that's probably going to come out when practitioners start to work through this and what values go into planning. And that's probably a perspective that's going to be really influential and powerful, especially at the local level. The other big thing that I think is especially concerning is that I think it was only one or two people out of maybe the 72 definitions actually talked about social equity and justice. That might be because it's becoming a newer topic within this area of resilience. Uh, kind of as a, if you're interested, a brief primer on how climate resilience planning has evolved. Yes. No, oh, hold on. We have, Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. The nerdier, the better. I'm not even kidding. No, no, I'm not even kidding. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's roll. Brief primer. Yeah. There's maybe a, a, a reason, right? Social equity and justice are now just kind of newer in the resilience field where we're starting to call it out more and realize it's like this foundational principle. So when we start to look at kind of the history of climate resilience planning, a lot of it started out as part of climate action planning. And so a lot of cities started to implement plans maybe in like the early to mid 2000s, right, where they want to start to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right, because they recognize that climate change is becoming a problem. And oh, no, if we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to acceptable levels, um, then we're going to see all of these changes that might just completely remake the global environment. But along the same time, they started to recognize that, like, even if we reduced our emissions, we're probably still locked in to some degree of climate change. And so folks started to talk more about adaptation and resilience, and they tend to use adaptation and resi resilience interchangeably. For my brain, just to keep it simple, I think of adaptation as one of those pathways to resilience, but just kind of to keep in mind. So they started thinking about, okay, how can we incorporate maybe these persistence or adaptation policies into our plans, favoring like low regret or no regret, um, basically reversible strategies that we could either take away if climate change ended up not really being a thing or not coming into fruition, um, or that would benefit us even if climate change never happened, right? So we probably wouldn't want to go in and completely move a city <laughs> if climate change weren't going to happen, right? So they didn't want to do any of those big transformative changes. And then over time, we started seeing things like Katrina happen and Hurricane Sandy and these major disasters. And we started realizing, oh, crap, like this is going to happen. Like, the, you know, climate change is happening. We're locked in 
to some degree, and we really need to start rethinking the way we're making our systems. And so a lot of cities, I'd say around like the 2010s or so, started to put out their first iteration of climate adaptation plans where they start figuring out, okay, let's not just find things like energy efficiency and water efficiency that overlap with climate mitigation planning, but let's also look at how we make those incremental changes. Right. So move from this idea of what can we do to prevent climate change that, that may or may not be happening to what can we do to climate change that is happening, um, which, frankly, for many cities is more important anyway, because you see things like 200 jets, 200 private jets flying away from the Super Bowl, like I saw that graphic the other day. And, you know, what Peoria, Illinois doing, I mean, you know, is small potatoes compared to a lot of that in terms of mitigation, but in terms of adaptation, it's very important. I, I see that. So that's the movement then towards resilience and, and planning that way. Is that right? Yep. And then like in 2013, we kind of have the Rockefeller Foundation all of a sudden put like an enormous amount of resources into this concept of urban resilience, which basically then brought us to where we are today with more of the transformative view of planning, where we start to say, okay, let's not just like make incremental changes, but let's seriously rethink these systems. And that's when like social equity and justice starts to come into the picture. Now, not every city has reached kind of this transformative urban resilience or transformative, just resilience planning in general. Um, and they could be anywhere along this spectrum, right? And so that might be partially why equity and justice are just starting to come into the picture a bit more because we're just getting our heads around, you know, what is climate change? What is it actually going to do to our cities? There's so much uncertainty in our planning. How can we possibly predict where to put our resources? Um, but we're kind of realizing that these other issues like equity are really foundational to this concept of resiliency. And I will bring up, we had a conversation before with um, Vidya Balasubramaniam. It was one of the, I don't know, I walked away from that interview. Um, at the time, she was working for the Illinois DNR Coastal Management Program. And now she's working, I believe, for the, um, like, she's in D.C. working with, I think, like, the Office of Coastal Managers or something like that. And um, it was like one of the most inspirational discussions about climate change that I've had in ages, because she was, she was having the same thing. We're like, we have this, this wonderful opportunity to rethink how we're doing everything and try to set things up in a more equitable and just way. And that's, that's a really, really cool way to approach stuff. That's right. And if you want to go see that, you can uh, go to teachmeaboutthegreatlakes.com slash 36 uh, for episode 36 or just, you know, scroll down in your podcast thing or whatever. This has been really cool to hear how you're um, defining um, different ways to define resilience. And it's actually helping my brain, too. Like when you talked about adaptation as a pathway to resilience, I'm like, oh, yeah, that that, that makes sense. That, that jives. Um, so now if you have a definition set up, what's the next step for people? So one of the things that I found in the review, I kind of hinted at a bit, was the fact that people are using these definitions in very different ways, and they're not consistently even using those three pathways of resiliency, right? And so basically, the consensus is there's no consensus. Uh, <laughs> and is that a problem? Maybe not too much, but it's important that we probably get on the same page. And so um, I know folks at the University of Michigan are actually starting to follow up on this a bit. And they're, I think I just saw an invite for a workshop about how to, how we should be defining resiliency within the Great Lakes coastal setting come out um, yesterday. So great timing for this conversation. Um, and so I think the first thing is to get folks on the same page of, okay, we might not necessarily agree on what the definition is, but what should our shared vision be when approaching this problem? Who are the vulnerable populations? Who is resilience for? What sort of approaches do we want to use? Do we want to armor um, in some places where maybe we absolutely need the ports for local economies? Um, or do we want to explore like these other mechanisms a lot more and try to focus more on coastal restoration and natural habitats? Um, do we really want to try to pri prioritize coastal retreat um, and really kind of start to dive into those five W's a bit more um, and come up kind of with like, what are the bounds maybe? So establishing that shared vision and some kind of framework, you hit on one of the points that um, came up in a lot of our conversations um, with the co-authors that I worked on this paper with, uh, where there isn't really even a clear idea of what the coastal system is, right? And that's really important when we start getting into like the planning guidance that is out there, because I've seen community plans that say this is a coastal master plan, but they don't even touch on coastal hazards. They're just a coastal community. And so they consider it a coastal master plan. Um, you might have a region kind of doing the same thing, but they're focused maybe on the first like 1,000 feet 
of the coastal zone that they expect to be impacted. Whereas others might say, okay, communities um, 20 miles inland are still benefiting from these coastal resources, so they should be part of the coastal plan. And so um, it's also important as we're developing planning guidance to figure out, you know, who are we trying to benefit? What should the goals of this be? What are even the hazards we're talking about? Where do we draw the line when we start talking about coastal hazards? Um, Because I usually often will think of like coastal flooding and erosion and those like really obvious like impacts directly from the changes to the coastal system. But there's also harmful algal blooms that are becoming more frequent that impact public health, right? And changes to recreation and all those sort of things. So um, it can get really sticky because if you do too much with a plan, at what point is it just becoming useless and not even specific to resiliency? And that's kind of a conversation that's come up when looking at those different pathways to resilience um, and why we still, I think, see a lot of climate adaptation plans that might not take that transformative approach to. When you try to develop resilience policies that affect every policy sector, but you only have like one, two, maybe three people at most 10 in a city like New York City dedicated to resiliency planning and implementation and its evaluation, a lot of the a lot of the plans are just going to sit on the shelf. And what use are they if they're so broad that we can't ever even implement them? And so, again, I think kind of revisiting this and having a really targeted conversation, again, with the smarter people in the room, maybe than, you know, even me with the coastal resiliency stuff. Right. I mean, I'm still young in my career and there's folks out there that have been steeped in this. And again, like that practical knowledge of what resilience actually means in practice um, is a necessary first step. And then after we get our heads better around what resilience is, because again, like this paper helps to show the different perspectives out there, but again, the consensus is there's no consensus. And so after that, developing that specific technical assistance for communities and figuring out how we better center equity in these conversations and work through a lot of those tensions and understand the trade-offs, right? When we start talking about private property protection versus maybe habitat restoration for the broader community, um, we need to figure out how do we value um, those trade-offs and make those difficult decisions so that we're generating the most overall good, the most overall resiliency for all people and not disadvantaging folks through through this work. So, And so we'll drop links for the different papers that um, and resources that we've mentioned throughout this at the show link. What's that going to be, Stuart? <laughs> The show notes will be at teachmeaboutthegreatlakes.com slash 76. Well, Sarah, this is really interesting, and I'm so glad to hear you. Actually, what I'm really glad is is to hear how you're involving all these other people, because what I worry about with this kind of stuff, the reason I worry about this is I am a guilty party here, is uh, as academics, we love to sit around and, and think about these very sort of important, but sometimes minute in the real world differences among definitions and stuff, right? And you can sit there and do that all you want. Um, and you can do that with your snifter of brandy uh, and your cigar and your little patches on. You don't have any of these, I noticed, but I record every episode. Uh, for those who are not, I rec- every episode, it's a snifter of brandy and a cigar in my, my I can I can confirm that. Yes. Laser. <laughs> Yeah, totally confirmed. I'm in a lounge. Anyway, the point is you can do that. But and 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 uh, but but I'm I'm glad to hear that you're working. And this is of course what planners do. But I'm glad to hear that you're you're working with that. And it all is all fascinating, very fascinating. But that's actually not why we invited you here on Teach Me About the Great Lakes this week. The reason that we invited you on Teach Me About the Great Lakes is to ask you two questions. And the first one is this: If you could choose to have a great donut for breakfast or a great sandwich for lunch, which would you choose? <sighs> a difficult question but i think i would go with the great sandwich for lunch i'm always kind of more of like the savory salty sort of gal um and i don't know if you've ever been oh no you're you're not from michigan but we have this really great place jelly pumpkin that's okay this is the (laughs) follow-up so let's hear it i want to hear it it's in uh ann arbor and i think there's also some in detroit so i'm at the university of michigan so i'm here in ann arbor and it's one of our like favorite local pubs kind of to go to they've got like this nice um it's like an outdoor like balcony on the top floor Um, and you can like sit out there, sip on like one of their, I think they brew their own beers even. They've got this like one really good like citrusy orangey one. So that with like the tofu bibimbap is just to die for in my opinion. 
our former director loved that place. He would like talk about how every time he went to Ann Arbor, he was like, oh yeah, you just go to the Jolly Pumpkin. So like you describing that. And then when you said the Jolly Pumpkin, I was like, ah, shout out to Brian Miller. You see, I was not, I was not made aware of the Jolly Pumpkin. This is, this is unfortunate. Our current, oh, that's no good. I guess talk about Zingerman. Zingerman's fine. If you want to wait for a long time and spend $80 on a cup of coffee. But all right, all right, fair enough. Uh, cool. Jolly Pumpkin, I'm going there. I'm getting the bebop. And when I'm there, I'm going to be thinking about uh, special places in the Great Lakes, actually. Uh, I'm going to be thinking hard about that. Is there a special place in the Great Lakes that you'd like to share with our audience? And what, what makes it special? So I, I guess I have a couple. I'm kind of tied between two. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm from upstate New York, the Rochester area. I grew up in Webster. And my parents both grew up on the Great Lakes near Webster. And so, you know, we're a Great Lakes family. And when I was young, we always used to go hiking um, in this like one park right off of Lake Ontario. And then afterwards, we'd go and we'd collect like beach glass together, the three of us. I'm, I'm an only child. <laughs> and my dad was actually a stay at home dad and my mom worked and um, we're a very close family. And my mom's the type of person that like gave up promotions so that she could come to all my sports games. So, you know, I love them. They're great people. Um, and so like the kind of that pier in, in Webster where, you know, we would collect the lake glass was always really special to me. But I also, there's this um, one wetland off of Lake Ontario where you can go kayaking and you like kayak through the wetland and then you get to this stream and you can kayak up the stream. And it's like, you're going through all these different mini ecosystems. And like after a long day of work in the summer, I would just go kayaking for like two, three, four hours um, back in like high school and college. So that's another one that's really special to me. So it's a, it's a tie between the two. Which wetland is that? I don't know exactly what it's called, but it's um, it's like Bay Paddle is like the kayak place that I usually would launch from. It's not like a big wetland or anything, but it's like right off of around Aquit Bay, which is off of Lake Ontario. And then you just kind of go through there. and It's a lot of fun. Fantastic. Sarah Adobe. Uh, doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan in the uh, Urban and Regional Planning Department. Thank you so much for coming on and teaching us all about the Great Lakes. Well, that was great. I love uh, talking about resilience because it is something we talk about a lot in the program. And and I've never been super comfortable with the definition, but I, I really like this notion of, yeah, you're not going to lean into the ambiguity. That's what I take from this um, is that, yep, instead what you do is think about what are we talking about when we talk about resilience? That's the thing to think about. Think. Yeah, no. And it's really, um, it's really cool that someone is doing this because resilience is such an important issue in the Great Lakes region um, and, you know, going back to the the Lakey nominee that we had at the beginning, that there's this huge list of, again, like federal and state and provincial and tribal groups and, you know, all working together. Um, and it's the same type of thing that's going to need to happen if we want to make good progress. Yep, I agree. And what's funny about it is like sometimes in some sense, the definition doesn't matter because we all know vaguely what it is and it is fuzzy. But in sometimes it matters a lot because once you start writing laws and, uh, you know, uh, requests for proposals or whatever, like like then all of a sudden definitions really matter. So it's this weird thing where it's both not that important, but also really important all at, all at once. And so I'm, I'm glad to see a bunch of smart people thinking about it both on the academic side and on the practitioner Great. side. And um, Sarah's going to be presenting in your session at Iagler, isn't she? She is, which I totally realized before we interviewed her, and that's why I reached out. No, uh, yes, I was doing, so um, I, along with Kathleen Williams from the EPA and Dr. Becca Nixon, uh, who was an awesome postdoc and postdoc in the Coastal and Great Lakes Social Science Lab, which is the lab that I, I head up, uh, we're putting together a session on revitalization, community revitalization in the Great Lakes. And uh, and Sarah's going to be presenting this paper on. It's probably going to be on Thursday. She'll probably be at about ten in the morning. So if you want to see her, um, and you're going to be at Iagler in Toronto, the big T, as I like to call it. T dot O dot. What does that mean? Yeah, maybe when you're in Toronto, you can ask somebody. Is dot what they call period in Toronto? Maybe that's the Canadian. No. no. Anyway, T dot O dot. That's what I call it too. <laughs> oh yeah, I call it. Too. I am in the know. So uh, in T dot O, T dot. That's at T dot. <laughs> 
if you're going to try to make a new thing, maybe stop and think, you know, there are big cities in Canada too. They may have their own thing going. But yeah, point is that everybody will, everybody will be at the International Association for Green. It's the T-Dot in America because of the, the, the oh, exchange rate. It's like a T-Dot is T. All, All right. right. Yes, we'll be there. And then also though, while we're talking about Aiglers, May 8th through 12th in the T-Dot, it's going to be the most of the stuff's going to be at the Hilton in downtown. Uh, they still haven't released all the venue details, and I think some of it's going to be at Toronto Metropolitan University. But I actually don't know that for a fact. Just go to iagler.org, i a g l r.org for details. But if you're going to be in the T dot, the old T D, uh, we are also going to have uh, Teach Me About the Great Lakes live. We don't know when. My guess is it'll be Tuesday, May 9th, but we haven't worked out those details yet. DTs for the TD, but we will. And then also on Monday, May 8th, we know for a fact during the day, we're going to have Ask Dr. Fish Live. Are you going to be part of that, Carolyn? Uh, yeah, that's my plan. Yep. And the exciting thing about that is I've never done live video before and I am completely incompetent, but at least I'm also under-resourced. So it should be interesting. So I recommend coming along, uh, but put on your dumpster fire pants, kids, just in case. <laughs> Teach Me About the Great Lakes is brought to you by the fine people at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. We encourage you to check out the great work we do at iicgrant.org and at ILIN Sea Grant on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. Teach Me About the Great Lakes is produced by Hope Charters, Marilyn Foley, Megan Gunn, and Rini Miles. Ethan Chitty is our associate producer and fixer. Our super fun podcast artwork is by Joel Davenport. The show is edited by the awesome Quinn Rose, and we encourage you to check her work out at aspiringrobot.com. If you have a question or comment about the show, please email it to teachmeaboutthegreatlakes at gmail.com or leave a message on our super popular hotline at 765 496 I I S G as in great. You can also follow the show on Twitter. Can you still? At Teach Great Lakes. <laughs> I mean, you can, and not super active. Like, it's nothing but Elon Musk tweets now. That's all Twitter is for me. So I log on and I just see what Elon Musk is up to, which is not always at the top of my mind, but that's uh, that's what happens when you go to twitter.com now. T dot is what I call it. Twitter.com, the old T dot. Thank you for listening and keep grading those lakes. <laughs> How much you want to bet I can no longer hear it? $75. $75. All right. Which side of this are you on? I don't know. I don't know that I want to actually fully take this bet. Go. <laughs> okay. No, you shouldn't. You owe me a lot of money from your bets.